We saw Blinken and Wang Yi met on the sidelines of the UN General Assembly, marking their fourth meeting this year. They talked over an hour, according to CCTV. Wang Yi stated that the U.S. can't treat China with two faces, as uh, Professor Tsai mentioned, simultaneously suppressing China while seeking cooperation. Blinken actually countered that after the meeting, asserting while China claims to want peace, it allows Chinese companies to supply weapons to Russia for use in Ukraine. This meeting also served as a warm up for the upcoming conversation between Biden and Xi. So the four meetings between Blinken and Wang Yi this year show increasing intensity in their dialogue. Does this, does this indicate the beginning of change in US-China relations? Professor Nakamin? Uh, I think this is a really important moment where we're creating more floor to stand on. I think it's, it's no secret that the US-China relationship has been rocky for a number of years now. And the fact that Wang Yi and Anthony Blinken are able to have dialogue is a good thing. It's good for Taiwan, it's good for the United States, and it's good for China. Because without dialogue, that leads to misunderstanding and miscommunication. Mm. The U.S. presidential election, uh, when it is approaching you know, within 30 days, both Trump and Harris seem to have adopted an anti-China stance, even though uh, we saw that uh, Trump this year uh, maybe is equally unfriendly to Taiwan. So what, what is your take on this? How do you see China's attitudes, I mean China's attitudes, influencing the election dynamics in the United States? So uh, I think, you know, anti-China is perhaps uh, not what I would use to describe a lot of the politics. I think it's much more, uh, you know, uh, haw hawkish is probably the better word because anti-China infers that they're actively trying to fight against China. And I think it's more about trying to find a balance of how do we compete against China while also finding room to cooperate. Mm -hmm. uh, because neither party, I think, within the establishment of the parties at least, are trying to go just a complete uh, anti-China direction. But the challenge, of course, is both have to address the growing uh, a combative relationship that we've had with the PRC for the last number of years. Uh, and I think what the uh, Harris campaign has been trying to do is to try to, at the very least, signal it's going to follow into a lot of Biden's footsteps with, you know, competing against the PRC while also trying to slowly improve the relationship. Uh, as to Donald Trump's campaign, uh, your guess is as good as mine as to what he will actually say or do if reelected, because we've seen a lot of back and forth between his campaign right. about whether or not he is supportive of Taiwan or not supportive of Taiwan. So uh, I think we're all very eager to see the results of the election just so we can even know what to even expect in the in the coming mm -hmm. years. OK, so it's um, pre predictable uh, on, on, the, on the parts of Trump. Uh, Professor Tsai, so, you know, the same question for you is that, you know, there has been four meetings between Blinken and Wang, right? Uh, this year. So do you, do you see any kind of rapprochement between the United States and China in the future, in the near future, especially in the aftermath of the U.S. presidential election? Maybe they try to shake hands, right, in international occasions. They try to have some telephone communication. But the thing is that under the scenes, there are a lot of competitions going on. So I would say this, the era of constructive engagement is over, okay? So they need to compete uh, on many, many fronts, okay, such as military stuff, such as uh, technology stuff. So for China, it's a very, very uh, a rock and a hard place for China to choose which candidate uh, would be the president. Because, you know, for, if Trump were reelected and he would pursue a tougher uh, China position, especially he will tariffer on China's goods exporting to the U.S., if Harris won the presidency, and she will follow suit, like Professor Negman said, she will follow suit President Biden's mm -hmm. approach, such as a tech war with China. So either way, it's not going to uh, get China off the hook. So the thing is that it's better for China not to bet on any candidate right now. They just keep an eye on the ball and then see what happens, because it's just one month away. Mm -hmm. Okay, You don't choose sides. Okay, before the final result. Okay. Okay. Uh, Xi Jinping has recently mentioned Taiwan multiple times at the Chinese People's uh, Political Consultative Conference and the 75th anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. He declared a firm opposition to Taiwan independence, which is not surprising, and separatist activities stating that Taiwan is a sacred territory for China. 
So what signal does this stand? Is it a response to the recent military vessels from Japan and other countries crossing the Taiwan Strait? Uh, I don't know that it's inherently a response to one particular event and more just very in line with what we know Xi Jinping will say about Taiwan. Mm -hmm. I think, especially in recent years, any opportunity that he has to uh, sort of emphasize uh, the territorial claims that the PRC makes over Taiwan, he's going to reemphasize those. Uh, and given that we are sort of at this cross point in the U.S.-China relationship, I think it's more likely he's going to emphasize that claim uh, not just for his own domestic audience, but also for an international audience uh, as time goes on. Okay, Professor Tsai? Yeah, the thing is that he tried to use that kind of language, all right? Uh, the unification of the country is a historical necessity for the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. So he tried to appeal to national sentiment to Taiwan and also try to sell one country, two system framework to Taiwan. But there's no market of one country, two system in Taiwan because you see the case in Hong Kong. But the recent military vessels uh, sailing through the Taiwan Strait demonstrate one thing. The Taiwan Strait is a high sea. It's not internal waters claimed by China. So we try to seek uh, autonomous democratic state uh, rather than pursuing the dual independence. Because a lot of people in Taiwan, they maybe like seven or 80 percent of people supporting both maintaining status quo. But for China, if you still, uh, Taiwan issue like two Chinas, right? One China, one Taiwan, they are all the same, okay? This is the, the typical part for us to, to be able to live in a democratic country, okay? Mm -hmm. Okay, in addition, the economist mentioned that the People's Liberation Army, PLA, has been applying a so-called uh, anaconda strategy to pressure Taiwan since the Lai administration took office. The PLA is ready to blockade uh, Taiwan anytime if they wish. Under what condition, uh, Professor Nakman, do you think that uh, the PLA would be likely to attack Taiwan? Uh, so I, I think that, first of all, this isn't so much a new strategy as much as it's a strategy we've seen in development for a number of years now with an increased number of both the quantity and the quality of these sort of incursions into Taiwan's air defense identification zone. As to under what conditions would we actually see military conflict, I think it's a matter of very specific red lines being crossed. So specifically, uh, Taiwan unilaterally declaring de jure independence, which is not going to happen in the near future. Uh, or if the world suddenly starts formally recognizing Taiwan as a de jure independent country, which is also not likely to happen in the future. Uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that the very specific red lines that we know would trigger a conflict are very unlikely to happen. Uh, and instead, it's much more likely that if we do see a conflict in the short term, it's likely due to error, uh, human error, which is, which is a very small percentage chance. To put differently, I don't think we're necessarily going to see conflict in the short term. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Professor Tsai. Yeah, because uh, in, the, in the China... Uh, in China's anti-secession law, it says, okay, one thing, the possibility of, for peaceful reunification should be completely exhausted. So this is the one condition they can have a reason for cash belly to unify Taiwan. But like you're saying, right, uh, they try to use uh, anaconda strategy. But I would say this, okay, in the animal world, uh, the harpy eagle is the predator of anacondas. So that means when China tries to gobble Taiwan up, the U.S. will swoop in and deter China and protect Taiwan. Okay, that's my energy. Okay, um, <laughs> at the same time, the Biden administration approved a 567 million military aid package for Taiwan in late September, marking the highest amount of military assistance to Taiwan under the president's authority. So what message is the White House trying to send to Beijing, especially you know, when Biden is going to step down and he's going to become a part of history? And you know, how are we going to remember Biden when he's uh, in office you know, treating Taiwan? Professor Nagman. I don't think this is any new signal. You know, this is really just following well-established practices by the United States of selling uh, military arms of a defensive nature to Taiwan, which is part of what governs the uh, policies around the U.S.-Taiwan relationship. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, every single package that the United States sells to Taiwan upsets the PRC. And we're likely going to see the exact same kind of reaction from the PRC as we do every other time the U.S. approves this kind of arms sale. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that there's inherently a worse 
uh, version of this. It's just sort of the exact same response that we're going to get as every other time. Okay, Professor Tsai, a follow-up yeah. quick for you is yes. that uh, DW uh, finds that Biden's decision to approve the largest military aid package for Taiwan in history coincides with the final stretch before the U.S. presidential election. Uh, like what I asked the previous question, they say that by accelerating the transfer of defense resources to Taiwan, Biden aims to mitigate risks in case former President Trump returns to the White House and reverse the Washington's pro-Taiwan stance. So how do you assess the Biden administration's action to protect Taiwan? Yeah, President Biden has clearly stated five times the U.S. will defend Taiwan in the event of uh, China's unprovoked attack. So that means uh, he tried to say this is uh, the time, uh, the era of strategic ambiguity is somehow gone. We need to, you know, have another uh, policy like strategic clarity because it's very, very important and for Biden, but he's not Trump's uh, approach because Trump tried to say, uh, you know, we should deal with this issue, uh, just U.S. and Taiwan. But for Biden, it's, di it's a different strategy. He tried to use coalition, right? Try to persuade Japan, the Philippines, come together and uh, de deter China. So that's his legacy. Even maybe one month later, Harris got elected, then she will pursue the same policy or same approach like Biden did.